<clears throat> so a few weeks ago, I started a series on just the life of Elijah. Started there at chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And that's the introduction of Elijah. He stands before the king and says, You know, until I pray, you know, there's, and ask for rain, there's not going to be any rain in the land. And uh, we see in this chapter that as a result of that, uh, Ahab accuses Elijah of being a troublemaker. He certainly brings trouble upon the, uh, Israel at that time. And so the title of the message this afternoon is Troublemakers. Troublemakers. <clears throat> Some people have a reputation of being troublemakers. Sometimes it's not really their fault. They didn't really do anything on, you know, to, to get that title, but that's just what they uh, have been called. Uh, I think about this at raising children. Uh, one thing that always drove me crazy was whenever somebody would label our children a certain thing, like uh, <laughs> my, son, my son's like, yes, that's right, that's terrible. Uh, I, I typically, I usually think of Sharice, actually, whenever I think about this, because she had that personality whenever she was a little, really, really, really little, of being sort of a bully and sort of uh, uh, ornery and like, you know, uh, even had a little bit of a, you know, she's going to climb trees, she's going to bruise her knees and all that. So a little bit of a, what some people call tomboy. And I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about this before, but I, I hate the idea of, of what they call tomboys. Now, certainly there's some girls that are okay with handling worms and bugs and playing in trees and all that more than other girls that hate that kind of stuff. That doesn't make them uh, more masculine uh, necessarily or anything like that. But uh, but my I remember as a, as a parent, thinking, I don't want people to just go around telling, saying, oh, you know, you know, oh, there she is. There's that little bully or something like that. And then put it in her head where this is who I am. This is just, I can't help it. You know what I mean? Because we kind of do that to people sometimes. Or a little boy, you know, like, eh, so since I picked on her, I might as well pick on Brayden. So Brayden would be like, oh man, he's Henri. You know, you, you come in the room and everyone's like, oh, I can just see it. He's Henri. And he is, but <laughs> I'm just teasing. But I didn't like the idea of hey putting a label on him and making him uh, uh, to you know now he's got this this stigma you know that that this is who he is, and we got to be real careful about that when people are are, are young. You know, it makes me think about you hear these stories uh, about. Um, parents who, you know, maybe their boy uh, picks up a, a girl's doll, a Barbie doll or something like that. And they're like, oh, he likes girls doll, uh, girl dolls. I guess he, he wants to be a girl. And then they start dressing him up like a girl and all that kind of stuff. Can you believe that actually goes on? But I've heard stories and I've seen people, I've known people that, that they have their boys to dress like girls or something like that. And I'm thinking, your child has no clue how life works. He was just interested in a girl doll. That doesn't mean <laughs> anything. And so adults will sometimes put something on a child that is, is ridiculous. Let that kid grow up and let them do what they're supposed to do. And things like will naturally be worked out. And of course, we understand uh, there's a huge agenda and some wicked stuff going on in our world uh, in regards to some of that uh, ideology. But, uh, but, you know, what I'm getting at here is sometimes people are, have a label of being certain things. Uh, I remember, you know, a few times I get into some, uh, um, um, this is a personal example, so I don't really know. Sometimes we think differently about ourselves than everybody else does. But uh, on, on Facebook, I was known at some point, at one point for causing, stirring up some drama on Facebook. And I would just post something and then somebody get mad about that. And then all of a sudden I got this reputation, like, oh, you just like to stir stuff up. Honestly, I don't feel like I'm that kind of person that just likes to stir stuff up, but that was like the reputation I got. So I just try to stay back a little bit from some of that uh, drama. And in many ways, I don't like being part of that drama. Uh, and so sometimes people will be called a troublemaker and they really didn't necessarily try to bring it upon themselves. Uh, they just did. And then there's other times uh, where people do. It seems like trouble follows them everywhere. Like they almost want to cause trouble and they want to be drama and all that. And I want to talk about this where that's uh, in this sermon, particularly the point I'm trying to make is that that's not always bad. The kind of trouble that we're talking about is not always bad. Sometimes it is, of course. OK, and then uh, the truth is this. All right. Now, regardless of where you fall on this, as I preach the message, when it comes to causing trouble or trying to stay out of trouble or anything like that, 
Uh, regardless of where you fall, here's one thing you should know, that as a Christian, you know, if you're living for the Lord, there will be some sort of persecution that follows you. It's just how it is. There's, there's, if you're living for the Lord, there will be some kind of trouble <laughs> that you're involved in. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, there will be something, and, and, and I hope you'll understand that as I, as I go on. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I don't think we need to go there and look at uh, that whole context, but that's just a principle that we can understand. So what are some things that might happen? Okay, well, for instance, people get kicked out of areas for preaching the gospel. Now, I don't consider us a troublemaking church, but that's happened to us. We got the police called on us for knocking doors and giving people the gospel in an area where we weren't supposed to be. Right. But we had the uh, mentality that we got to obey God rather than man, that people need to hear the gospel. They have a, re a choice to reject it or not to reject it. We weren't trying to cause trouble, but trouble came. And sometimes even preaching the gospel door to door in areas where it's perfectly fine and there's nobody trying to stop you. There's still going to be some people that that pop their head. Out. We've seen this a lot lately. Right. Where somebody's like, oh, no, everybody back here is good. You know, don't knock on their doors or whatever. And we got to say, well, I'm going to go ahead and knock on it anyway and let them determine that. And then that can cause trouble. It can cause a little bit of drama that comes uh, that way. Uh, sometimes if you call out, especially if you're a preacher, you get opportunity to stand up here or uh, maybe in a certain uh, circle of friends or something like that. You might make a statement, a biblical statement about a particular person who who is well known. And maybe has a following or something like that. And the moment that you say that that person is wrong or that person sinned, that brings a lot of attention on you. And you say, oh, this person is just trying to cause problems, especially whenever a pastor does or, or a preacher gets up and preaches about a specific person who everybody loves and everybody adores, you know, especially if that person just passed away and you say something about, oh, that person, you know, unfortunately they're in hell right now. And everybody, well, what in the world? How could you say that? You know? Well, because they didn't believe in Jesus, right? But the people don't want to hear that. So they'll say, oh, you're just causing trouble. Uh, sometimes uh, you'll refuse to do questionable things that your authorities tell you to do, whether it's your government or whether it's the, uh, you're at work and you have a, your employer, you know, wants you to do something or wants you to be part of some kind of program or some giving, uh, giving to some organization, or maybe they want you to go to this party after work, you know, cause, cause it's your job and you have to do it. And you're like, well, there's drinking and all that. And I just don't want to have be any part of that. And you are going to, at some point in your life, if you're living for Christ, bring about, about some sort of trouble, some sort of persecution, probably follow that. That's just what the Bible says. And when it comes to causing trouble for the cause of Christ, all right, there's a big difference between causing trouble for the cause of Christ or causing trouble just because you're that kind of a person who likes to, uh, to fight or likes to, uh, you know, bring shocking things. And, and, and you know, uh, there are people out there, obviously, who try to cause trouble. And it's not has anything to do with the, with the cause of Christ. It's just what they like to do, what they're drawn to. But when it comes to causing trouble for the cause of Christ, I want to look at this passage that we're in, 1 Kings chapter 18, and show you three types of people that we can see represented here as troublemakers, okay? Troublemakers. Number one are the Obadiahs. How many just knew before this message, if we said the word Obadiah, you would be like, oh, I know exactly who Obadiah is. All right, good. nobody raise your hand. Some of you are all just being modest. You like you do know, but <laughs> most people never heard of Obadiah, or or they, hey, I know the name, but I just can't really remember who he is exactly, or or or, or whatever. Well, let's talk about Obadiah here for a minute. And I would say Obadiah represents people who they don't want to appear as troublemakers. They don't. They're not interested in getting into trouble. They don't want drama. They don't want any of that. Uh, but and maybe sometimes. It comes across as, or maybe it even is a little bit of a coward, you know, like, I don't want to face that. I'm not interested in that. And so they try to avoid that as much as they can. And, uh, and although they are indeed, because they are living for the Lord, they are causing trouble here and there, but they tr really try to avoid it. And, uh, and this would, I think, would be a good example of uh, Obadiah, or Obadiah would be a good example of this, all right? Here's the thing. Obadiah really did, 
however you want to define it, he did cause some trouble. He did do some things that the king wouldn't have wanted him to do. If you look at verse uh, 3 and 4 of our text, 1 Kings 18, 3 and 4, it says, And Ahab called Obadiah. Now, the king there, Ahab, is a wicked king. His wife is even more wicked than he is, but he's a wicked king. And uh, he's got this man, Obadiah, who's working for him. Now, look, some point in your life, you're going to be working for some wicked people, probably. You're going to have some people in authority. Maybe it's your, your leader, your political leaders or something like that who are wicked and they're over you. That's your, that's your authority in some way or another. This was the case with Obadiah. I don't know this background, how he became in that position. Maybe it was by force. Maybe he was a servant. I don't know. Uh, but he was uh, the governor of Ahab's house. Okay, He was made to be the governor. Kind of reminds me of, I mean, he's kind of in good company with people like Daniel and Joseph, right, who were just kind of put into a position of leadership under a pretty wicked guy, if you really break down everything that their, lead, that their authorities stood for. In this case, Obadiah was working for Ahab, all right? But here's what it says in the parentheses. Look at the end of verse 3. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So Jezebel does something to cut them off. What does that mean? I'll, I'll show you here in a second. I think that we have a little more insight in this, in this passage, but whatever, you could look at that and almost say at first, like she just cut them off. In other words, I'm not going to take care of them. You know, they're not welcome in our, uh, in our region or whatever. So they're cut off. And Obadiah just said, well, then I'm going to take care of them here. We'll put them in this cave, put 50 here, 50 over here. I'll feed them. I'll take care of them. It seems as though he kept it sort of secret sort of hidden from Ahab and hidden from uh, uh, Jezebel. Otherwise, he would have gotten in trouble. And so he just kind of uh, took care of God's people. He did it, you know, a little bit in secret so that he wouldn't cause, a, uh, cause attention, attract attention and cause a lot of trouble. Certainly wouldn't want them to be found out where they are and then get them killed or anything. So he kind of, you know, you think a lot of stories in, throughout history where uh, there was a really bad, uh, you, you know, we always think of like Hitler or somebody like that. And, and there's stories about people who would, who would hide out some of the, the Jews or something like that and to avoid persecution. There's all kinds of stories about that. But um, uh, this was sort of the case. But he says he did it because he feared the Lord greatly. Okay. And when Jezebel uh, uh, cut off the prophets, he took, he, he took them by fifties, put them in caves, fed them, took care of them, gave them water and all that. Look at verse 12. Now, in verse 12, he is explaining to Elijah, after he sees Elijah, he's explaining to him uh, what he did. And it says, uh, and, uh, let me see here, and it shall, let's see, mm, okay, at the end of verse 12, but I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid an hundred men in the Lord's prophets uh, of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water? So now we see whatever she means by cut off, she was actually pursuing them and trying to kill them. And so in the pr presence of them being killed, he spared some of them. OK, now, look, he knew when he did that, if he got caught, he would get in trouble. He knew what he was doing went against what his his authority told him to do. But he chose to do it in sort of a secretive way, sort of an underground, you know, let's stay out of trouble. I'll still try to be uh, obedient as much as I can to my authority and not get in trouble. Uh, but I've got to obey God rather than man. And some people wouldn't respect that. Some people would be like, you know, he's just a coward. You know, he needs to just stand up again. He doesn't need to work for this guy. You know, he needs to get out of there and just run away or whatever. But that's interesting because in the Bible, there's a lot of guys who we see faithful to the Lord, and yet they have to work under wicked authority. It's just where they're, that's their lot in life, uh, where they're made a servant or something like that. And they don't necessarily lead a rebellion. They don't necessarily fight against the king. They just try to live for the Lord and at the same time try to be as, much, as peaceful as they can uh, in the situation that they are. And that's important for all of us as Christians because we're going to work, again, in order to make a living, in order to survive in this world, we're going to live under some bosses and some, some authorities that are not godly. 
And, uh, you know, we certainly wouldn't want to, uh, you know, to be involved in some of the things that they do, but we're just kind of like in that situation. That's our lot in life. We have to work under their authority. I believe that was kind of the case with Obadiah. And then, the, uh, then we get to verse 11, and here's where he meets Elijah. Now, Elijah is basically an outlaw. Ahab is doing everything he can to find Elijah and, and stop him because here's the man who's preaching against, uh, against what the king's doing and telling him that it's a sin and telling him that because of his sin, you know, God's going to stop it from raining and, and, and he's going to cause drought and all this stuff. And so Elijah is kind of, a, uh, of an outlaw here. And look at verse 11. He says, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's start with verse eight. And he said unto him, uh, uh, he says, I am, I am Elijah. And he says, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And this is o o Obadiah's response. And he said, what have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go, tell, the Lord, uh, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I, not, I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. And then I already read the next part. All right, so here's another trouble that he caused his... Authority, Ahab is saying, you know, it's, it's clear he wants Elijah stopped. He wants Elijah gone or at least brought to authority. And here Obadiah has a chance to, to do that and to arrest him or whatever and bring him to the king. But he instead is on Elijah's side. And so now Elijah is sending him and he says, hey, go tell him that I'm here. And he's like, oh, yeah, right. I'm going to go tell him that you're here. And then we're going to come back and you're not going to be here. And he's going to kill me. You see how Obadiah, because you can get a little bit of a reputation that he's a little bit of a, uh, of a chicken, right? He doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't want to get in a fight. He doesn't want to get, uh, imagine this. He doesn't want to get his head cut off. <laughs> but it's easy to read the story and be like, oh, I'm not an Obadiah. I'm an Elijah, <laughs> right? It's easy to do that. But in this case, I don't see where Obadiah is really doing anything wrong. He's just represents uh, the type of troublemaker who wants to as much as he can to avoid that and all. Now, I, I've admitted myself and probably some of you don't look as highly at, at, at me as as uh, as you would have otherwise. <laughs> but I've admitted myself. I'm a little more uh, Obadiah ish. OK, when it comes to trouble, I've preached a message on uh, being uh, diplomatic and about trying to avoid these things and being peaceable and all that. Like that, a lot of preachers aren't that way. A lot of preachers are like, hey, well, I just want to be in the forefront of the battle and all that. And I'm going to talk about that because I think that's respectable. And uh, that's, a, that's a quite honorable place to be in. Remember this, I asked you who, who would have really known who Obadiah was, and I don't know, hands went up. He's not obviously a famous person. If I said, who's Elijah? You'd have, oh yeah, we know Elijah, right? But in, the, in this case, uh, Obadiah was not one of those guys, right? He did in fear. I mean, he did indeed fear the Lord. Okay, and he he continued to serve a wicked king. Unfortunately, that was what he where he was. But he's in good company. Like I said, you got people in the Bible like Joseph, Daniel, Nehemiah. I mean, these are under kings that aren't necessarily good kings. They might have done some good things from time to time, uh, but ultimately they were pagan and uh, and did some bad things. How about Esther? Esther had to marry a wicked king. And, uh, and so she was kind of stuck with that. That was her, her lot in life. Now, Jesus never taught Christians to just rebel against authority. In fact, sometimes, and some people take this too far, but sometimes uh, we see in the Bible where he's basically saying, hey, you know, re respect the authority and, uh, and give, uh, give honor unto the uh, Caesar. And I'll look at Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 15. Matthew 22, verse 15. When, uh, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, 
We know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not uh, the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And of course, they're trying to trip him up. And, uh, and, and they're trying to catch him and, and make him look bad. But here's Jesus' answer. It says, He perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me, ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscript, uh, superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are, uh, that are God's. And so we understand there's an idea that says, hey, you're living in this country, you know, you're under the leadership of this king, whether you like it or not. I know we can make the argument about America is set up a little bit differently and everything, but um, the point is there are authorities over you, maybe not so good of people, kind of wicked. And he says, look, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar, give unto God that which is God's. Now, Jesus, I don't believe, fell in the Obadiah category, right? After all, who is he talking to right now? The religious leaders. And he's like, you hypocrites, right? He's, Jesus kind of brought trouble with him places, okay? You say, oh, no, not Jesus. He was meek and lowly and all that. Yeah, he was. He was, a, he was, he was I was about to say Christian. He was Christ, okay? And, uh, and his, so he was perfect. But if you think about it, what got him killed? Was he was he was a troublemaker in the right way, in the godly way. And so uh, and so he's not the Obadiah type. But what are the effects of the Obadiah type? Now, I believe he was indeed rewarded by God for the works that he did for the Lord. I believe that, uh, you know, he managed to keep himself alive. He managed to keep himself uh uh, you know, not in harm's way too much. As far as I know, I don't, I don't know if the Bible records, I don't remember where it records anything else about him as far as the end of his life. But here's what this reminds me of also. Um, you know, there are those people you ever go, we, we, you know, we go soul when it's been a thing that happens quite a bit actually, where you will knock on a door, it's hot outside and you'll find a believer. The believers maybe not even living for the Lord, certainly not going to go out and go uh, knocking on doors and soul winning with you. Uh, but they appreciate what you're doing because you're a Christian. They say, hey, yeah, I'll, you know what? All my neighbors need to hear this. And then they'll say, hey, you want me to get you a drink of water? And uh, we'll take a drink of water for, from them. And I, I try to most of the time say, yeah, sure, I'll take one. And, and like, you know, I don't want to rob them of a blessing. Uh, occasionally I'll say no. But uh, look, the Bible talks about this. Look at Matthew uh, chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, and look at verse 42, and whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cold, uh, a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Uh, Mark 9 talks about the same thing, and it talks about, hey, if, to his disciples, if anyone gives you a drink of water in my name, you know, he's not going to lose his reward. And I think about that, and I'm like, you know, those people aren't out there in the battle. They're not knocking on doors. They're not confronting people and all that. But they're like, hey, this is great. You know, go do that. Hey, let me give you a cup of cold water. And they're going to still get a reward for that. But wouldn't it be nicer if they would actually get on board and say, hey, you know what? Let me go with you. <laughs> Why don't you teach me how to do this? And we've had people say that. Like, I want to I want to do what you're doing, you know. And uh, and they want to get involved in the battle. There are people who, uh, for what for different reasons, they don't get out there. But maybe they're, you know, I think about in Iola, we got some folks, uh, uh, older, and they could go out there still, but they're like, you know, I don't think I'm going to get out there and do that. But, you know, here's what we'll do. We'll make sure the church is clean while you guys are gone, and we'll do this, and we'll, you know, make sure you got uh, something to drink and something to eat and whatever. Like, they're, they're doing something. They're doing something, but they're not necessarily getting in to the heat of the battle. Uh, this is what that kind of reminds me of. Another thing it reminds me of are people in the tribulation. Look at Matthew. You're in Matthew 10, I think, still. Look at verse 23. Matthew 10, verse 23. 
What I mean by tribulation, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, I don't believe like some people teach that tribulation is like the whole seven year period that the Bible talks about in Revelation. But I think when you compare Jesus' words and, and uh, Daniel and Revelation, all that, that what we see is there is a time before the coming of the Lord, before the resurrection, where God's people go through great tribulation. Okay, And so this is not uh, when God pours out his wrath and he's like sending fire down and he's like bringing locusts up out of the ground and all that. But it's a time of tribulation or trouble that God's people go through. And, uh, and the Bible talks a lot about that. Here's an example, verse uh, 23 of Matthew 10. It says, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciples that he be... Excuse me, as his master and the servant as his Lord. And he goes on there, look at verse, uh, look at chapter 24, Matthew 24. This is a great passage that explains the end times uh, events that are going to happen from Jesus' own mouth. Uh, Matthew 24, look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. All right, what does he mean there? Look, there's a lot of mis, uh, there's a lot of bad doctrine that's come out of this verse where they say, see, you got to be, if you're going to be saved, you got to endure to the end. You got to keep up doing the works and you got to endure all that to the end in order to be saved. Except for that's not talking about spiritual salvation. Right. Spiritual salvation is just through putting your faith in Jesus Christ and receiving his free gift from the works that he did and the sacrifice that he paid for us because he's the only one that could pay that price and it's not our works. So when it talks about he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. It's talking about the tribulation. Whoever makes it to the end of that time is going to be saved out of that whenever Jesus comes and, 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 and uh, takes them up. But we understand when we read Revelation that there's going to be a lot of people that don't make it to that point because they're killed for their faith. And, uh, you know, maybe they're out there preaching the gospel and they get their head cut off, you know. And so they stand before God in Revelation chapter 6 and they're saying, Lord, how long? You know, how long before you, you justify, you know, you, you, give, you avenge us? And, uh, and they say, hey, just a little while, there's going to be some more, you know, that are going to be persecuted, and then, the, and then the Lord's going to come back. I'm paraphrasing, of course. All right, so um, but here's the thing that I want to mention. What is the reason that some people make it to the end? I think it's quite possible that a lot of those people that make it to the end are people that are hiding out. <laughs> now, I don't mean that they're not, because here's what I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'm not ever going to hide. The tribulation, I'm not hiding. Well, praise the Lord. You know, if you want to go into the heat of the battle, get your head cut off, go for it. <laughs> but the people that say, you know, hey, I'm going to I'm going to go like behind. I'm not talking about living in a bunker saying, hey, I'm just going to kick my feet back and eat a bunch of spam until Jesus comes. Uh, I'm talking about like you're trying to stay alive. And so you're going to you're going to stay Is spam, even a survival food. I don't know. I think it lasts forever. <laughs> but you can uh, what I'm talking about is you kind of hide out so that you can avoid the war. You're not just like, hey, that's it. Let's take up arms and let's go to battle and all that. Well, go ahead, but you're probably not going to make it, you know? And other people say, I'm going to try to make it and I'm going to go, what does he even say? Flee to this city when they're persecuted. You know, it really, truly, I mean, even Jesus fled sometimes. Even Elijah fled sometimes. So we're not talking about people that are just cowards and don't want to do anything for the Lord. I'm saying people who are just like, you know what? You can go call, be, a, be the one causing trouble and getting all the persecution and whatever. Not everybody has to do, <laughs> has to do that. Okay, this is, the, this is what I think about whenever I'm reading about Obadiah here and his mindset. Okay, I don't know. I, there's that within me that's like, I want to be an Elijah. I want to be an Elijah. But you remember at the end of Elijah's life, I don't have it written down here, but at the end of Elijah's life, he's going to pass some things on to Elijah, Elisha. And he says, Elisha, you know, ask, ask what you want and I'll give it to you. And he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And he says, you've asked a hard thing. And what he means by that is, you, th you want a double portion of my spirit, but you don't understand the persecution that's going to come with that. You don't understand how bad Jezebel is going to go at the Jezebels of this world and the Ahabs are going to come after you. You don't understand the fleeing that's going to have to t take place and the, and, the, and the persecution that you're going to have to go through. And so, uh, and so I want to say, man, I want to be an Elijah. But I know that sometimes it's like uh, I'm a little bit more of an, of an Obadiah, okay? But there are different types of people. There's troublemakers like Obadiah, and then there's troublemakers, part uh, number two, like Elijah. These are people that seem to 
openly bring trouble with them. Now, if you are an Obadiah type, or maybe you just don't like any trouble at all, you're not even Obadiah, uh, you might say, yeah, those people, man, they get what has got coming to them, and they're just troublemakers, and, and how dare them, you know, they're just causing people to, uh, to not want to be Christians because of all the trouble that they cause and all that stuff. Well, I think Elijah, again, was in some pretty good company. There were a lot of good godly men and good prophets and all that, you know what, trouble seemed to find them everywhere they, they went. As an example, when John the Baptist came, very similar. In fact, they said he, Jesus said he had the spirit of Elijah. He said, in fact, if you can receive it, this is Elijah. And it was prophesied that Elijah would come. And, and he definitely came in the spirit of Elijah, meaning he had the same mannerisms. You know, he had the same, he preached like Elijah used to preach. And he was, a, 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 you know, he was not afraid to go to the king and say, you ought not do this. This is wicked. And he went and did that, and he brought a lot of persecution on himself. John the Baptist got his head cut off if you didn't know the end of that story. Now, what's funny about that is Jesus, at some point, we won't go there, but Jesus said to some of the disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, so this is after John the Baptist was dead, of course. They say, well, some say that you are John the Baptist risen from the dead, or, or some say that you're Elijah, right? Well, why would he put John the Baptist and Elijah in the same category, and why would they say Jesus... You know, was some people thought that he was one of those guys. Why? Because they all had the same spirit of not being afraid to go stand before the kings and preach the gospel or preach the, the truth of God's word and preach against their sins. And uh, even if it rubbed people the wrong way and caused uh, some problems. So if John the Baptist, you know, and Elijah and Jesus himself and all of the prophet, many prophets uh, of the Bible were those kinds of men where trouble kind of followed them around a little bit, then who are we to look at a man who's willing to take up a little bit of trouble, you know, and get in people's face and say, hey, that's not right. I'm not going to stand for this and I'm going to preach against it. And we all say, oh, how dare him do that? He's just bringing on trouble for all of us, you know? Well, then go, go be an Obadiah and hide out a little bit, <laughs> right? But you're still going to have to do the work of the Lord. You still got to obey God rather than man if you're going to serve God and follow him. Okay, so Elijah was definitely one that uh, was known to cause trouble. Look at chapter 17 again of our text. Uh, oh, let's see here. Second King, I mean, First Kings 17. Or actually, we're in 18, but look at 17 again. I, I read this to begin. Uh, that when Elijah's first introduced, he says, uh, There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Okay, now let's look at 18 and verse 17. So Obadiah goes and he gets, uh, he meets Ahab and says, hey, Eli I found Elijah. Elijah said, come meet him at such and such a place. And verse 17, and it came to pass when uh, Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> He's saying, hey, you troublemaker. You know, what are you, gonna, how, how, I don't know how you did it, but now we're in a famine because you're, uh, you know, uh, because it, it's like, if, if, if a guy gets up and, and starts, you know, preaching against uh, uh, a certain group of people, right? Let's say LGBT community, and they're preaching hard against it, and everybody's like, oh, man, he's just causing trouble, and he's getting all this. And then, like, there's, like, some, some huge thing that happens, like, a, like a, a, a nightclub gets shot up or something like that, and they're, like, there's rejoicing and all that kind of stuff. You guys kind of can follow through with my illustration here, can't you? <laughs> Okay, they're like, man, these guys are causing all kinds of trouble. Are they really? Are they really? Uh, this was the mindset of Ahab. You troublemaker. <laughs> You're a troublemaker. Well, look, all he's really doing is he's preaching against your sin, and he's saying, God, you know, uh, bring a drought in this time. Can you imagine if a, guy, if, a, if a famous preacher got up and said, you know, I'm praying that God brings famine and drought in the USA. Now look, it's coming one day. We, I believe when we read the Bible, we see that it's coming one day. But what if a man went on record and everybody saw him and he said, I'm praying every day that we go through a drought and famine. And people are like, oh, but if we do that, then a lot of people are going to die. That's all right. That's what we need. That's what we deserve. They're going to be like, oh, this is a terrible man. He's just a troublemaker. He just wants to get, you know, he just, what is he talking about? You know, and I remember that guy, uh, uh, <coughs> 
after 9-11, everybody was, God bless the USA and all that stuff. And there was one preacher, he was a wicked guy too, so I'm not, I'm not defending him. But he was, like a, uh, he was like a black rights activist or something like that. But he's, I mean, I'm not, that's not what makes him wicked necessarily. But, uh, but he, uh, he went on record as saying, you know, everybody's saying, God bless America, but I say, God damn America. And I, went, I remember watching that the first time saying, oh, this man just said, God damn America, right? And now, many years later, I'm looking and being like, you know what? If America had a little bit more condemnation, if America had a little bit more uh, 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 hardships and trials, because look, the 9-11 thing didn't last very long. And no matter what you believe about the, you know, how that started and all that kind of stuff, uh, it only roused people up for a little while. You know, I remember all the politicians holding hands and singing God bless America. How long did that last? A couple years later, they're like, you know, they're, they're like kneeling whenever the anthem is played and they're, you know, uh, uh, doing all kinds of stuff because they don't, they don't really care. And they certainly don't care about God. I mean, a couple years later, it's just like, oh, no, no, we're not a Christian nation. We're, uh, you know, we're, we have Muslims and we have this and we have that and we're that. Like, we understand that we, we don't live in a Christian nation. We understand that. But as a result, if they're going after different gods and they're standing up for this wickedness and that wickedness and it goes against the Bible, as Christians, we should be willing to say, well, you know what? Then we don't deserve the blessings that everybody's praying for and saying, God bless America. We don't deserve that if we're not going to live for the Lord. So can you imagine a preacher getting up and saying, you know what? I'm praying that God brings a curse upon this nation. Boy, every IFB church around here that you know <laughs> would be, this guy's got to be stopped. Somebody's got to muzzle this man, right? Because he's a troublemaker. Boy, he's not any different than Elijah. <laughs> Elijah prayed that the rain was shut up. And, and, and what did Ahab say? You trouble, are you the one that troubles Israel? Right? I'm not saying America's Israel. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> okay. But here's the problem. Here is who the, who the real troublemaker is. Look at verse 17. He says, And it came to pass, Ahab saw Elijah, and, and Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And this was Elijah's answer. And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou in thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450. We'll get into that uh, next week. But he begins to challenge them and says, hey, I'm just putting all my eggs in a basket, so to speak. And I'm going to show you right now that he is the true God. But he's brave and he's bold and he goes before them. And he's really, although he comes across as a troublemaker, and he certainly is causing trouble, right? The truth of the matter is the person who is to blame is Ahab and Ahab's descendants, Ahab's fathers, you know, that did all kinds of wickedness. And God in the, you know, says through his prophets over and over, like these are the men. It's because of them that, it, that Israel is going to go through this. And it's because of them that they're going to go into captivity. It's because of them that they're going to have famine. It's because of them. And he's saying all these things because of those leaders who did wickedly. <clears throat> Obadiah. The only reason he had to hide people in a cave to begin with is because Ahab couldn't control his wife, who said, "Hey, we're going to cut off, all, we're going to cut off all the uh, uh, the prophets." And so Obadiah had to be a troublemaker in his own little uh, uh, diplomatic way, I guess, and and he had to go hide these guys out, you know, and he had to uh, you know uh, go against Ahab on all these different things because Ahab was wicked. Elijah, the only reason he prayed for a famine was because there's no amount of explaining, no amount of reasoning, no amount of showing the Bible to Ahab uh, that was going to get Ahab to change his mind. So he had to take drastic measures. It was Ahab's stubbornness and his wicked behavior that caused all the trouble. Even if Elijah was the one that got the bad rap for it, I bet you all of Israel was like, oh, not all of Israel. I'm sure there were some godly men that were on Elijah's side, but so many of them, I'm sure, were like, oh, somebody stop that man. Oh, somebody shut his mouth. He keeps getting us in trouble. Oh, somebody tell him, you know, that it's not his prayer that, uh, that caused a drought in Israel, right? <laughs> somebody, stop, somebody stop him and, and, uh, and all these things. But really... Uh, it wasn't his fault. It was Ahab's fault for doing so wickedly. He was just a righteous man trying to stand up for, for the Lord. And he was in just as good company as John the Baptist and even Jesus himself for being a type of troublemaker. 
that he was. <clears throat> All right, so number one, application. You don't ever want to be an Ahab or a Jezebel, okay? You never want to live wickedly and bring the trouble upon you or your nation or your church or your family or whatever because of your wicked deeds. But rest assured, if there's trouble, and that's the reason why, you're the troublemaker, not the preacher that's trying to preach against your sin. Not the, uh, the men and women that uh, are trying to correct you and rebuke you for the lifestyle that you're living. You know, you're the one that's causing that and bringing that upon yourself. But secondly, you might be an Obadiah and not a, an Elijah. You know, honestly, I think some people try too hard to be an Elijah type of a, of a guy. And it's just really not, it, it's not helpful sometimes. You know, uh, but it might be okay for you to just work you know, even if your boss is, is wicked, you don't have to correct everything that he does. Uh, but at the same time, don't do evil. You know, don't, don't, uh, you know, you got to obey God rather than man. And then you might be an Elijah. You might be an Elijah. And you might get a reputation. You know, you might get a lot of attention. And you might, uh, you know, bring all that upon yourself but you better be ready. If that's the case, you better be ready for all that's going to follow and not be like, what happened? Now I'll say this, Elijah went through depression. You know, there's times where he, he went and he hid out and said, hey, I'd rather die. I just can't handle this persecution anymore. I can't handle everybody coming against me. And you can say, you know, oh yeah, well, it's your own fault because you're a troublemaker. But the truth is, God didn't see him as a troublemaker. God's going to reward him greatly for the work that he did. Uh, but it still had to, he still had to bring upon himself uh, a lot of persecution, a lot of trouble for that. I always think about in James where he says, Brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater damnation. All right? He's talking about our condemnation. I can't, I think it says, but it's not talking about going to hell. It's saying, it's saying in this life, Hey, if everybody wants to be that preacher that gets up there and, and, and corrects everybody and all that, they don't even understand that, that, that they're bringing along with that extra persecution. They're bringing with that a whole uh, uh, rough lifestyle, you know, and, and everything they say is being judged and they're accountable for it. And there's people recording their messages and saying, hey, can you believe they said this and they said that? And they're, and they're criticizing everything they do, right? It's like, why does everybody want to be like that? And I know not everybody does, but, you know, there are a lot of people who try to be an Elijah when they probably shouldn't be. But then there, the world, no doubt about it, needs more Elijahs. It needs more people who are bold and, and willing to get in the, uh, uh, the king's face, so to speak, and to preach the, boldly uh, the word of God. And so I pray for uh, those men of God who will stand up and be an Elijah. I also pray for the Obadiahs. And I pray that none of us would ever contribute to or be an Ahab or a Jezebel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you uh, for the men and women here that are willing to go soul winning for you and bear a little bit of a reproach, though that's uh, in our country right now and this is the situation that we're in. We, we bear little, little persecution, very little. And uh, I pray that you'll help us to stand up for truth. Uh, obviously some people will do it to varying degrees, but I pray Lord that you'll help us to do what's right and that you'll bless. And some people I know will make it to the end. Uh, and some people will, uh, will die for their faith, but one day things are going to get a uh, really serious and then we'll all be faced with a decision whether or not we're going to follow you or, uh, or be cowards. Lord, I pray that you will, uh, help us give us wisdom, understanding, and I pray you bless the baptism to follow here, Lord, and you be glorified in what's done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.